Hello, uh, my name is Michael, and uh, my topic is for the lightning talk is RPM spec file templating with RPKG utility, preproc, and RPKG macros. So this is pretty long title. Uh, I have only 10 minutes, so I hope I can squish it in, but it should be quite simple. So first, uh, RPM, sp RPM spec file templating, that's the main topic here. So let's look how such template uh, can look like. You can see this is a spec file, but it has some additional syntax in there. Uh, those um, brace triplets. And uh, in those triplets, there are basically some macros that render content or some parts of the spec file dynamically from some other data. In this case, from git metadata um, of the repository where the spec file is placed in. So those macros will basically read git metadata and, for example, uh, render a repository name. Or uh, in the case of this macro, um, it will output contents uh, of messages of uh, git annotated text. So you can, with this, you can store your change log in git annotated text. And you can actually, when you, pop, when you create a new tag, you can populate uh, the message that uh, is going to be stored in this tag from individual common messages. So this way you can uh, reduce manual work that uh, is uh, inherent uh, to maintaining spec files. You can have some data stored in Git uh, and take uh, those data and put them into the spec file in case where those data are supposed to be the same. So it should basically make uh, packaging easier. Um, so I will try to explain how it works and I will try to make my work uh, from bottom to up. First I would, there are, there are three uh, components. The most uh, basic ones is preproc, which is basically uh, the template engine implementation itself. So it doesn't have anything uh, in common with uh, RPM or with Git. It just reads some text files. It uh, looks for the brace triplets. It executes the contents and replaces uh, replaces std out of this execution uh, with this with this tag. So it just it's, it works like bash command substitutions. Basically, it executes the command, and the std out becomes the result, becomes what it what is put into the text in the end. So this is also a template that preproc can uh, render. So the command looks like this. I'll just cat this template into preproc and std out goes into info uh, takes the file. Done. I have that uh, file open here. I will reload it. And you can see finally my email address there. So this is how preprog works. Now RPKG macros are macros for preprog that uh, preprog can execute. Um, and those macros are intended to be used in spec files. And, uh, and to render some parts of the spec files dynamically. So I, I've implemented uh, some set of those macros, uh, which are git rpkg macros. They basically uh, do what I uh, what I said in the beginning. They read git metadata and uh, um, render, for example, version or git change log, uh, rpm change log or name or release into the spec file. So. 
So um, implementation of those macros is in the file macros, uh, macros d git bash, and I can source it, I can pass it to preproc as an input parameter where uh, it should look for the macro definitions. And this way I can learn preproc to actually uh, be able to execute those, those kind of macros and to process text files that contain those macros. And I also pa uh, pass some environment va variable there, input dir path. Uh, this is necessary for correct operation of uh, the git macros I've implemented. So I, I will run it and it will print the rendered spec file to std out in this case. And you can see uh, this is different spec file than I've uh, uh, showed you initially. This is the spec file that I've rendered. Uh, the template for is, is here. And it's a spec file of RPKG utility itself. It's a bit more complex. Uh, but you can see I also use git there changelog macro here. And this got translated into a full RPM valid changelog in the end. And also um, name and version has been rendered in the beginning. RPKG util, which is base name of for base name, basically remote URL of the current branch and you take base name of it, you strip git suffix and you use that as name of the package. And version is derived from tag names. So finally, uh, what is RPKG? RPKG is a tool, a packager tool that uses preproc, uses RPKG macros and uh, glues it together and provides some comments on top of that. For example, a comment for building SRPM from a spec template. So you can change the operation by RPKG. You don't need to first render the temp template and then uh, call RPM build. You can just call RPKG SRPM and it will do all the stuff. But you can, if you want, you can do all the steps manually as well. RPKG and uh, VR renders name of the package, full name, the version and the release included. And RPKG tag creates a new tag. So you can see uh, uh, editor opened and I can edit the content that will be put into the resulting annotated tag. So I will just use this, even though it's pretty ugly because it has this macro stack which indicates uh, into what part of the code uh, the message relates, but let's skip this. It created a new tag and it produced new uh, spec which is rendered from the, from the updated state of the Git repository. And um, and you can see that the change log is updated, and version is also nice now. It's just three dot prototype. That's it. Thank you. So the main goals uh, of the project are improve household router sec cybersecurity. It's marketed as more than just a router, the open source center of your home. Uh, both hardware and software are open source and it's uh, available uh, publicly accessible from GitLab uh, instance of uh, CZNIC. Uh, to improve the, the home cyber uh, security, what they try to do is uh, two uh, most uh, uh, most important uh, things uh, of or, or goals or uh, uh, what, what they what they make them uh, special compared to other routers. First is that they provide automatic unattended updates and security patches, and they declare they will do that forever. 
Uh, this uh, means that, for example, if there is any issue with uh, SSL or with the router, with kernel, because it, li uh, it runs on OpenWRT, uh, they usually provide an update within a matter of hours. The second, yeah, thanks. Uh, two seconds. Okay, uh, the, the, the second uh, uh, distinct thing is that they gather network intelligence. Uh, they detect new threats, uh, they collect that intelligence from the, the routers and act upon them. It means uh, they provide the rules for uh, the routers uh, which uh, can be downloaded automatically and protect against uh, newly discovered threats. Uh, again, uh, it's uh, usually working in a matter of hours uh, uh, from the detection uh, to creation of the rule and pushing them to the routers. The, that uh, part of uh, the, the rules uh, pushing is automated, uh, but to gather the network intelligence, it requires explicit opt-in. They are very concerned of uh, end users' uh, uh, privacy, so they require explicit opt-in, even though the get, uh, gathered information is uh, strictly anonymized. They don't collect IP addresses. So the another marketing point is that they, they, they say it's the center of digital home. The routers are pretty versatile and extensible. Uh, extension kits uh, are usually LTE, uh, NAS, HackerPack, and other. History, the tourist project started at 2013, and there are three tourist products so far. Uh, the first uh, tourist router, one series, tourist Omnia, and tourist Mox. Omnia. It's a, a, a compact, design, compact design, uh, device, like you see. Uh, the MOX, its unique point is that it's, uh, it's modular. Uh, the modules are possible to connect into daisy chain, and as you see, even the plastic box is uh, modular. History, uh, Tourist Router 1, it was invite-only project for 1,000 users. Uh, it was a, a pilot proof of concept. It proved that the cybersecurity goal is achievable. Router was provided for free with two years lease contract uh, for something like uh, one check run. Um, but the manufacturing cost was pretty expensive. It used PowerPC CPU. Uh, because of the very high demand, uh, they uh, decided to produce Tourist Omnia. Uh, people were uh, going to, uh, uh, people were uh, approaching them asking, hey, we are going to pay you for Tourist One. We want it, but they were not able to, uh, um, to provide it uh, in higher quantities. So they decided to launch crowdfunding campaign, which was uh, very, very successful. I believe they uh, get something like one and a quarter million of US dollars on Indiegogo, while the Initial goal was just $100,000, and Omnia is currently available in commercial market for something like uh, just under $300 uh, without tax. Uh, tourist Mox, it uh, should be cheaper because uh, Tourist Omnia, uh, its uh, cost, its price, it's, it's prohibitive for uh, regular users. So it should be cheaper, modular, again, successful crowdfunding campaign, and delivery is scheduled this uh, month. I hope to receive it. <laughs> we'll see. The vendor is CZNIC. Uh, it's long-term goals of the project and continuous updates require stable funding. Um, R&D uh, funding is not achievable via sale of hardware because it's already uh, very costly and the cost covers just material costs. Uh, so R&D is uh, funded from other sources. Uh, the CZNIC is a non-profit organization founded in 1998 uh, by academics, academic members. It's founding member of uh, Internet Peer, uh, it's Internet Exchange in Czech Republic. It's a top domain .cz, uh, registrar, and it's established open source vendor. Uh, they produce BIRD, NOT, FRED, runs uh, national SIR team, Omnia hardware. CPU is uh, Rather powerful, it's, it's a high end in terms of uh, Soho routers, dual core ARM. It uh, has uh, two gigabytes of RAM, eight gigabytes eMMC flash, uh, LAN switch chip with five uh, one gigabyte Ethernet ports and another one port, uh, which is shared with S SFP slot. 
So it can either uh, act as uh, one port, uh, Ethernet one gigabit port or SFP. Uh, also possible to connect MSATA or another mini PCIe uh, extension cards. Uh, it has RTC with battery crypto chip, uh, uh, USB, GPIO pins, SATA, manufactured here in Czech Republic. Uh, included extension cards, if you buy what, uh, the router for those $300, it's uh, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz uh, Wi-Fi cards, free dual band antennas. Uh, the only part which is not open source is a binary blob from the vendor to 5 gigahertz card. Uh, optional extensions, uh, any mini PCI or MSATA controller, uh, as long as it fits in size and is supported by uh, Linux, it uh, runs on OpenWRT. So uh, there, is, there is a Linux kernel. Uh, what is provided uh, by CZNIC and tested to work is uh, 4G LTE modem and uh, two port MSATA controller. Software, default is Tourist OS, it's a spin of WR, open WRT. Uh, the, the, the OS is same for Tourist One, Tourist Omnia, and Tourist Mox. Uh, there are also uh, deployable um, images of Debian and OpenSUSE. Uh, vanilla Linux kernel shall run and the runs. Uh, not all devices are fully supported yet, uh, for example, SwitchIP. A switch chip can uh, use just one of two uh, one gigabit uh, links. Otherwise, uh, it, the, the support is uh, is full in kernel. Doo -doo -doo. So what they add on top of OpenWRT is automatic upgrades and patching, butterfly file system with automatic snapshots at boot, which are used for recovery in case anything goes wrong. Uh, you can use any standard OpenWRT packages and repositories. Uh, they also add additional packages for the dynamic network protection, as mentioned at the uh, beginning. GUI for is uh, their own uh, GUI, which is uh, even e easier, and it's, it's designed for standard users, regular users who cannot use Lucy because it's still too complicated. Uh, performance benchmarks, uh, they did uh, uh, IPsec 300 megabits, open uh, VPN uh, almost one, 100 megabit. Uh, CZNIC claims that they measured uh, almost one gigabit of throughput with uh, not turned on and uh, 300, 450,000 packets per second. Uh, recovery capabilities are uh, very... Uh, Broad, you can roll back to the previous uh, image, you can factory reset, you can refresh router from USB, uh, boot from serial console. It's very hard to break that router. This is the board, and that's it. Do I have any time? <laughs> Questions? Uh, there is nothing like a uh, 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 high capacity battery inside. Uh, it, it is extensible in a lot of uh, uh, ways, so it's up to you. <laughs> okay, thanks. I am Vasek Pavlin. I work for Red Hat. Uh, I studied at this university, and uh, this is the brief history of the rubber ducks. At fit. So first the question, uh, who hasn't seen the glass box with the ducks over there in E? Hasn't, hasn't. Okay, so we have like 10 people. Uh, so after this talk, you need to go there, you need to look at it. It is a one in a lifetime collection of rubber ducks. But I have the rubber in quotes and that's very important because I'm gonna talk about it a bit later. Um, so, this talk is not about technology. I'm sorry about that. I know you came to DEF CON mostly for technology, but there are also non-technology non talks here. So, it's fine, it's fine. So, what is it about? Um, for those who didn't see it, this is the glass box with all the rubber ducks. And uh, there is a story that they say at this paper, and this, like, it brings some controversial conspiracy theories about that. So, let me tell you what is there. So it asks, why the ducks, right? 
Um, so the ducks, the rubber ducks in the IT world um, serve as a help for a programmer. Uh, if you want to debug something and you don't have anyone to talk to, uh, you can talk to the duck and you explain the problem. And by explaining it, you will realize the solution, right? Um, it says that this is, it basically says that this is why the rubber ducks came to existence here uh, in, at FIT, because this is a school for programmers mostly. So that's, that's why we put the rubber ducks there in the fountain. Uh, it very, uh, very well explains that uh, the rubber ducks are appearing in the fountain after people finish their uh, final exam, so either bachelor's or master's. Uh, I would prefer people do that just for the master's when they are leaving the school, but um, that's possible as well. What I'm going to say about that is that this um, explanation why the rubber ducks is completely wrong. This is not the reason why the rubber ducks are here at FIT. The reason is that I wanted to put something in the fountain. Uh, in 2012, uh, we had the idea when we were finishing our studies here with my friend here, uh, we had an idea that we should probably do something crazy, right? Uh, so we thought of going to the fountain, swimming there, grabbing a beer, taking a chair, doing something fun like that. And then we talked to this gentleman who is uh, like maintaining fit, keeping it running, making it as awesome as it is. Uh, you might have seen him roaming around the... He is there? Okay, that's good. <laughs> roaming around the uh, hallways and like fixing all the stuff that is going on. And we somehow mentioned this idea to him that we want to go swimming there. And he was like, are you crazy? I know what I'm putting in there. I wouldn't ever, ever <laughs> stuck my feet in there. <laughs> so like, okay, maybe it's not a good idea to do that. So. We're like, okay, so let's, let's, let's figure out something else. And I'm not sure who actually, whether it was me or my friend or my ex-girlfriend, someone came up with an idea. So we want to do something in the fountain. So let's just put something floating into the fountain. And what floats best is a duck. The catch there is that this is not a rubber duck. It is a very hard plastic duck. So it has nothing to do with rubber ducks, programming and stuff like that. It's just a duck that can float in the fountain. And this is actually the, four, four, three, four, uh, the first four ducks that were there in 2012. Um, this is another proof that there was nothing else in there. So basically, this explains that there is the story, like it's because it's a rubber duck debugging, blah, 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 it has nothing to do with that. Um, I, I thank uh, Mr. Juticek a lot because he took care of the ducks very well. So he, put, he took them out uh, for the winter. He put them back in the summer. Uh, I actually, the second year, 2013, after I finished, I was like, is, I was curious whether the ducks are still there. So I came back and I saw my ducks. So I just like used the marker again to like put, to, to let my, my name be more visible in there. And I think that 2013, 2014, people started to put their more ducks. So he always like fished them out and then put them back. And then it was too many ducks, so he doesn't really put them back. They just appear uh, organically, let's say. So I would like to appeal to fit to the university, um, pay some tribute to the oldest duck in there, the old guy, the big one. He is buried under those other ducks, uh, and he probably deserves more credit for like leading this revolution. Uh, so there is, this, there is this sign that 2014 and older, I think there should be like 2012 one. And it, it should have uh, its own shelf. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not like pushing on anything, but uh, it's just an idea that I would like to present. So if you, if you want to tweet to Fit Veute, um, you might want to do that and like make them do something about it. Because I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a bad that it's just buried in there. Hey, like, I don't know, send a picture and say, put this duck out of that mess and just like make it be visible much more. Uh, uh, it's uh, at FIT underscore VUT, I think. Um, yeah, just saying. I mean, is it recorded? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm, I'm done. Well, I'm done. Thank you very much. And uh, there is more stories with the ducks I can talk about. So find me at a party. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm just gonna talk from, from uh, memory. And uh, okay, so basically uh, I wrote a project called Jenny and what Jenny allows you to do is it allows you to run your Jenkins file uh, directly on your system. And uh, there is a reason for that. The point is, if you're actually using Jenkins, so who of you actually uses Jenkins and tries to write stuff? Nice, okay, good, good. So you're in, you're in the right spot now. Uh, the thing is there are some problems if you're actually using Jenkins files. So Jenkins files appeared with Jenkins 2 and they allow you to write your, your whole build pipeline into a single file, which in my opinion is amazing because you can actually specify how the project is being built. There is a problem with that though, that you can only run it in the Jenkins server, right? So what's happening in your system, you would actually set up a configuration which is kind of what you would use for development. So you set up, I don't know, uh, a Python server or whatever you're actually using to build a Maven build, so on and so forth. But this is actually different than the build you're actually gonna use in the build system. And this was, this made me think because, well, actually I'm not using everything from Jenkins. I'm not using plugins. And I strongly recommend against it. Even the Jenkins people, <laughs> they are not so happy about them. They have like over 10,000 plugins. They cannot maintain them. So I'm not using plugins, I'm not using any kind of crazy construct, I'm actually building Docker containers um, to set up my tooling. So the first stage of my Docker, my, of my Jenkins pipelines would be just build those containers. And afterwards I'm actually running the compilations, right, or whatever, I have to do tests, so on and so forth. And in the end I publish them. So since these are kind of my workflows, I realized, well, actually, I can, I can use a thing called shared libraries. Who of you know shared libraries from Jenkins? Wow, you should really look into shared libraries. That's super sad, super sad. So the, the reason why you should look into shared libraries, shared libraries are projects which can be outside of, of your current Git. So you can have actually a different Git repository, and you can extend the vocabulary of the Jenkins pipeline. So instead of having simple, I mean, we might get some slides soon. So instead of having super simple um, commands like sh or node or whatever, you can actually define commands that aggregate other Jenkins commands. What it means is you can actually run a few shell scripts, you can run uh, another, you can run another build inside, so on and so forth. And you can do that and you can parameterize them as well. Okay, so you can extend your vocabulary. So you can have stuff like run tests, you know, or whatever, as a specific word. So if you do that, you can also realize at some point, well, I can actually move my whole pipeline, right, into another Git repository, and then I can have them cross projects. So my Jenkins files in every single other project that I'm using, it's actually like 10 lines of code, and it does a, a crazy amount of things, right, it's like including builds and so on. So right now I managed to have over 20 projects all of them are having their own pipelines, full CI CD, feature branches for everything. Everything happens with pushes, and I would have a beautiful demo to show you. <laughs> that would be nice, right? Yeah. Uh, there any, is there anything you need to do to make the output go out? I can't make sense of your keyboard. I'm sorry. I, uh, I see I'm using Call Mac. So I'm using Call Mac for Call some Mac, reason. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, that's another uh, fun thing. So it's, it's great. I know uh, the benefits are undoubtable, but. I'm not skilled enough to use it. It's okay. So the point is, I'm going to, can you hold my mic? Yes, uh, you can talk. I'll, okay. I'll be a mic stand. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the idea is what if you can actually move the whole pipeline in another place and what if you, what if you can actually uh, run it locally, right? This is the whole point. If you can do that, then you actually have the capability. Hey, did it appear? Yeah, it yes. did. Cool. Yes. Uh, now only, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm still struggling. I just installed Ubuntu 18 and the great, great experience. No, that's not gonna happen. That's... Yeah, no. <laughs> so, um, okay, now we also have this. Okay, so let's, I'm gonna go straight to the demo because I think I have like two minutes left. The, the point is, you can actually have something like this. So you have uh, the stages and so on and so forth. If only Vim would refresh. And yeah, this is, this, there is no text in here. Good job, Vim. Okay. So you can actually have the pipeline and you can actually just run it, 
So we can do something like Jenny. And this one has an actual error. It doesn't check out the code, you know? So instead of pushing it randomly to my Git server, I can actually just run it with Jenny. And this one will try to execute it locally. And it's gonna fail because there is no Jenkins file. And of course, we can commit it. Oops. Um, actually, let me undo because this was the checkout. We can undo, we can do uh, inspects. So we can actually see what it's in, it's in that uh, Jenkins file. We can actually do all kinds of analysis, including for, um, uh, for shared libraries. So in my case, if I would have um, um, a pipeline, this is how a pipeline would look. This is how I'm using it from outside, right? I have a full pipeline externalized in a shared library. So my project, for example, of Felix, which is a Python thing, which at the end builds this binary, it's basically this. And I have another, uh, another binary, for example, if I want to do another Python project, I have another one, but it doesn't matter. Uh, you basically just define, okay, what's the name of the thing and so on and so forth, and the whole pipeline, it's actually shared uh, across the things, and it's in this beautiful project called Jenkins Lib, whatever. And in here, I have a bazillion uh, steps for the pipeline. And what I can do is I can actually go to the project, I cannot drop the mic now, but I'm gonna try to uh, show you kind of how can I actually inspect it and see what the heck is going on. Calling Germanium Build Monitor. Usually, until I came up with the name, I call it Germanium something. Okay, so this one is going to run inspect, and what's basically this one going to do is going to evaluate uh, the Jenkins file, and it's going to show me all the steps. I can select what steps I want to run, and so on and so forth. But these ones you can probably do. Uh, you can check it on your own. The whole point is you can run it locally. Whenever you do git checkout or SCM checkout, he's not gonna actually check out, he's just gonna copy your thing. So if you have other changes besides the Jenkins file, they will be applied. So you can iterate much, much faster. This was it, basically. I'm Josh Kinlow. I'm a senior software engineer for uh, Red Hat. I work on Red Hat Insights. And um, I've worked on the deployment pipeline and had a good time with that. So. Uh, in case you're not familiar, hybrid cloud is a combination of a public cloud and a private cloud. And so the public cloud allows you to serve content to the general public, whereas a private cloud allows you to serve content to a select group of users. Um, and so why, I guess you might be asking the question, why would you want to serve, if you can already serve to everyone, why wouldn't you serve all content to everyone? So it's nice to have a separate production server where you get all your application content to the public and then have another, another server that allows you to run your CI environment and your QA environment. And then it's nice to keep that separate from the public so that if you don't have something implemented like SSO completely, you can still um, test your application and the different features in there. So that's a good reason to have it in the private cloud. Um, so let's talk about how you could do that. Uh, so deploying to the public, the public cloud is, uh, if you're hosting your application on, or hosting your repo on GitHub the way we are, then you can use an integration service like Travis CI or Jenkins to build that application and then serve those files to the public cloud pretty easy with like a Jenkins server. A Jenkins server could take those files and then just push them to your www directory or um, however you want to serve them. Uh, for the private cloud, if, you're, if you have your files on a GitHub repo, you can't really communicate with the private cloud as easily. You can't set up a webhook inside of GitHub to communicate with that private cloud, and you also wouldn't want to push them straight from uh, Travis CI. So uh, the way we looked at it was, uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh oh, okay. Well, if we can't get the diagram, I can still talk through it. Um, so the way we looked at it is we took the application server on our private cloud, and we clone the uh, separate repo with the build files in them, and then watch that repo, and every time the build files change, we update the private application server. So uh, 
if I could get the diagram, it would be a lot easier to visualize. Okay, so the way it works is we have Travis CI build the application from GitHub every time that the, uh, either the production branch, the CI branch, or the QA branch changes, and then it pushes that branch over to the build repo, um, which, can, which is just a, can, like it just houses all the build files for that application. And then from there, the private, or I'm sorry, the, yeah, the private cloud application server watches that Git repo, the build repo, and anytime it sees a change, it pulls those down, and then it copies those files over to the, uh, it allows, copies them over to the www directory so that you can serve those files out of the uh, application server. At the same time, we have a webhook on that same build repo, and that webhook will, anytime that the production branch is updated, it will push that, those changes to the Jenkins server in the public cloud, and then that Jenkins server can then rsync those files over to the production www directory. So we have, we have the application git, git repo, and then we have the build files repo, and then we have the, the public cloud and the private cloud, and they both communicate basically with that build repo. Um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it from like a uh, simplistic view. Um, on top of that, a problem that we had is that we have multiple uh, development repos that are contributing to the same application, and rather than changing the build process in all the different repos, we separated out the Travis CI file and the Jenkins file to a separate repo, and then from there, each application will just curl that Travis CI file each time they change in the build process, and then from there they can, uh, it uses that same Travis CI file that's being hosted in the, the build files repo so that um, anytime we wanna make a change to the build process, we don't have to go and update all the different build repos. We just update that file inside of the uh, build files repo. So it kind of simplified the process as far as making changes across multiple applications. Uh, are there any questions on that? I think that, I think that pretty much sums it up. Uh, I have five minutes left. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean that's that's pretty much it. I had slides to go into it further, but going off the head, it kind of shortened it quite a bit. No, I'm sorry. Another lightning talk. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I don't have another lightning talk. <laughs> Yeah, hi, I'm Valentin. I'm working at Red Hat in the Container Runtimes team. I just recently joined in December, and I had some old slides, but my notebook battery ran out, so I prepared some paper ones, and that would be cool if this would work. So there seems to be a tradition in our team to have live demos and show some bravery, so yes, awesome, thank you. So I try to do it like this. Okay. Go ahead. So first. Does it work? Yeah, cool. So this is the title, Speeding Up, Pushing and Pulling of Container Images. Um, it basically um, should describe what we've been doing in the containers image library um, recently and also where we want to go, um, related to how we distribute or can use the library to distribute images. So the library in question, does it fit? Well, okay, I gotta scroll a bit. Let's do it like this. <laughs> Let's do it with animations. So the, does it work? Yeah, cool. So the library in question is containers image. It's not only used in uh, Scopio, Podman, Cryo, and Builder, but also in, <clears throat> in tools outside of, um, let's say, this community here. And it supports various kinds of transports. For instance, we can push and pull from a registry, from the container storage, um, from a directory, so really just a file system directory, so the images are exploded on the file system, and also OS tree, and I may have forgotten one or another transport. Docker daemon. Docker daemon. Yeah, it, 
Okay, I had to mention that at some point, okay. Um, so also the Docker daemon. The idea was to speed up pushing and pulling, which basically in this case involves the registry and the storage, right? When we pull, we contact the registry, which in the end is a web server, we pull some data from the web server, we explode it into container storage. The other way around, we push it to the web server. We wanted to do this because we've run some uh, basically uh, benchmarks and prof uh, profiling on our tools and we figured out that especially pulling was a bottleneck. And now it should explain why. Because the code was serialized. So if you execute code in a serialized fashion one after another, it takes more time than if you parallelize it. So we were looking into how we can parallelize it. We succeeded in at least uh, pulling which means that Podman 1.0 now parallel or pulls in parallel. And we also found a better library to speed up or basically compress in a multi-threaded fashion. So now we can pull 50% faster. And this is pretty cool. Um, we vendored the code also in Builder 1.6, uh, in Cryo 1.12, in 13, and in uh, the latest Scopio as well. However, Sorry for the slow animations. <laughs> However, the pushes are still serialized. Oh, sorry. You can interrupt me anytime, feel free. So the pushes are still serialized by locks in the container storage. Um, in containers storage, we don't have the benefits that, for instance, the Docker daemon has. So whenever Data, data is written, we need to somehow synchronize the accesses to the data that we want to protect or read and write. So we don't have this for Podman or for Builder because we have a daemonless architecture, right? Fork and exec model, more traditional fashion, and we didn't want to have a big fat daemon, so um, we had to somehow break out the logs onto the file system. So how we did that is basically using locks or f locks, um, which in this case serialize all accesses. So although in theory containers image can push in parallel to a registry, we still, we still need to somehow read the data first and this is effectively serialized. So the idea that we have now is to somehow transition the f locks into a read write lock. So I try to animate it here. It should demonstrate that we can read the layers in parallel and the write access, sorry, down here has to wait until all the reads are finished. Um, we also did some initial benchmarks which showed that if we do that, we're 20% faster than what we are now doing, um, which would be really great. Um, for sure, we compared ourselves to, to Docker. The cool thing is we were or are already now pushing faster than Docker is. Um, pulling with the recent changes as well. And um, this is pretty much it. Do you have any questions? Sounds good. So that was a lightning talk. Um, how many people in here have ever heard of C Groups V2? How many of you have ever used V2? C Groups V2? I think a lot of you are lying up there. So uh, C Groups V2, uh, C Groups was written uh, or evolves um, over many years and different people in different organizations, uh, different parts of the kernel basically just wrote C groups. And uh, if you ever listened to Leonard Pottering talk about it, he'd say that you know half of them really don't work or we're kind of lying and people are relying on it. Um, but we rewrote, we started rewriting it in the kernel many years ago, probably two, at least two years ago. And uh, C groups V2 has been worked on and um, there's no distributions that have it on. There's no distributions in the world that have it on. And that reason for that is there's a battle going on. There's a battle between Kubernetes and the container world and the kernel and systemd. And 
the reason for this is, well, the kernel and system D basically have said they won't take any more patches on VC groups V1 because it's just broken architecture. And so they're adding new, lots of new features um, to implement uh, C groups. Um, and system D is fully embracing uh, all of these. And um, it, Kubernetes world is all written to the uh, C groups V1 architecture. It's all written to the, you know, the way it was laid out, um, and you have full control um, in C groups v, um, V1. Um, so basically, if we turn on, uh, say, uh, distributions to the default to C groups V2, all of a sudden, every container in the world won't work on your distribution. So containers are important enough now that uh, all the leading distributions would not think of turning it on. Um, and because of that, you know, Kubernetes and containers have sat fat, dumb, and happy, and there's no reason really to uh, e evolve. Uh, so we needed a carrot and a stick. <laughs> See my, and I did not get permission to put this carrot up here, so I found it on the internet. Uh, so carrot. So the carrot uh, right now is, uh, you know, C groups that actually work, or, or at least you know most of the C groups uh, work as designed. Another. Nice feature of C groups V2 is that we have delegation. So if you saw uh, any talks on Podman rootless, right now there's no C group support in it. That's because non-privileged users are not allowed to manipulate C groups because if I access the C group file system, I have full control. So I have the ability to up and down C groups of any other process on the system. Um, but if uh, in C groups V2, there's delegation. So you could imagine, you know, each one of your users will get some subsection of C groups, and then they could further delegate down to, uh, say, Firefox, and I can guarantee Firefox won't use up all the CPU. If anybody's ever dealt with Firefox running off into Never Never Land, and, you know, all of a sudden you say, why is my machine performing horribly? Um, there's also lots of new C groups. All new development on the kernel is adding new C groups to V2. It's not a lot, you know, supposedly there's not any V1 stuff getting accepted. So there's a lot of reasons for containers to take advantage of C groups V2. But, you know, yet we still have stagnation. So to my opinion, we need to stick. We need to uh, uh, basically kick the C groups world in the ass and say, we're turning it on in Fedora 31. Uh, so Fedora 30 is, is closing down, uh, going to beta uh, fairly soon at that point. Fedora 31 is going to kick off, and I plan on opening a, a request to default Rawhide version of uh, Fedora to um, C groups. Of course, I always have the caveat that if it blows up in my face and we don't get it done, uh, we can always turn it off before 31 goes to beta. But I think we need to have a distribution that says, we want to run with C groups v2, containers finally fix the problem. And it's not only containers that are going to be a problem. There's lots of applications. You might even know some applications that read the way C groups v1 is laid out. So I know that Java, uh, the uh, JRE, right now looks at the layout of uh, how many C uh, how much memory and uh, maybe a few other fields to figure out how many threads it's going to generate. So any code that is hard coded to run C groups V2, or V1 is going to need to be ported to run on top, top of C groups V2. Um, so anyways, that's uh, my little uh, shtick, uh, my little carrot and stick on C groups V2. Anybody questions? Think it's a good idea? Yep. Yeah, well, that, that, those things are all going to have to be worked out. So device C group, um, I actually, um, uh, I, I know there's other mechanisms, EVBPF and other things like that that are uh, around. There's also no network device controller. Uh, but these questions, uh, you know, Red, Red Hat a couple of weeks, a couple of a few months ago was basically deciding on what's going to go into RHEL 8. And, and RHEL 8, there was a lot big push to turn on V2 C groups in it. And I, you know, we all pushed back on it and said, first of all, V2 probably is not enterprise ready. And when I mean enterprise ready, it had no, no distributions ever run it. So we're going to take an enterprise ready operating system and switch the control groups underneath it. Now, I'm sure, I've, I mean, Facebook and, and Leonard probably have tested, you know, they, they test well and I'm sure it works fairly well. But I still would rather have a million machines running V2 before we try to say it's enterprise ready. My opinion of 
So we, we missed REL 8. REL 9 comes out in three years. If we don't turn it on in Fedora this year, we're not going to make REL 9. And REL 9 then lasts for 12, 15 years, which puts us to you know the 2040 or something before you know I'll be in the grave by then. But you know, uh, uh, so it, it's got to happen. We got to move forward. These things have to be figured out, and carrots aren't working. Okay, thanks.